Hey everybody, welcome to GTech, and for a channel that's based entirely around building computers and gaming PCs and the hardware that powers them, I'm surprised I haven't made a gaming PC build guide sooner. So that's exactly what today's video is going to be about. It's going to be how to build your very own computer from the ground up with nothing but your own two hands and probably a screwdriver. So this video is going to be a little bit longer than my normal videos and that's because I'm basically going as in-depth and as detailed as possible as I can be. I'm mostly going to be talking about how to put the computer together physically, but I'm also going to explain all sorts of compatibility issues and stuff that you could run into. Basically every little bit of information that you need to know. So the main thing you're going to need to build a computer is your hardware, plain and simple. There's eight main components that you need to have. You need the processor or the CPU, the RAM, the CPU cooler, the motherboard, the graphics card, the storage, the power supply, and the case. So the processor is a Ryzen 5 2600. This is a second gen Ryzen processor with six cores and 12 threads. Cores are basically little bits of architecture on the processor itself that help split up tasks that your computer is doing. So typically the more cores and threads you have, the more things that you can do at once. So the motherboard that I have here is the MSI B450 Bazooka V2. This is a micro ATX board running on the B450 chipset. For RAM, I have two eight gigabyte sticks of XPG Gamix D3 30 RAM. And to keep the processor cool, I'm using the Noctua NHL12S. I got this in a bundle with the B450 motherboard and Ryzen 5 2600. For storage, I have a 512 gigabyte SSD from Inland. That's Micro Center's in-house brand. For the graphics card, I'm using the EVGA GTX 980 Ti Super Clocked Edition. This is a several generation old card, but installing it is going to be functionally the same as modern graphics cards. For a power supply, I'm running a 500 watt Thermaltake Smart series power supply that's rated for 80 plus efficiency and for the case i'm using a cooler master masterbox q300l i'm also going to be including four apevia rgb fans and all four of these fans are going to be controlled by a remote which can help change the color so that's it in terms of hardware that you're going to need next up is the physical tools that you're going to need to build the computer itself so aside from your hands obviously you're going to need a screwdriver. Typically you want a number two size Phillips head screwdriver. I have a 54 bit screwdriver kit here and I can guarantee you that I will probably only be using one if maybe two of these bits. So other things that aren't 100% necessary but are handy to have are a magnetic parts tray. This is literally just a metal bowl with a magnet stuck to the back of it. If you have magnetized screws it keeps everything in place, keeps them from flying all around and you don't lose your screws. For cable management, I just have zip ties. These are really handy for tying down cables, keeping everything nice and clean in the back. You can also use Velcro cable ties. I know some power supplies come with them. And another thing that you might need is isopropyl alcohol. This is really only necessary if you're cleaning thermal paste off of a processor itself. And the only thing left on this table is this like L wrench with a screwdriver bit on the end. This came included with my heatsink. Your CPU cooler will most likely vary. Not a lot of CPU coolers come with installation tools like this. Some come with teeny tiny wrenches. Some come with no tools at all. So you'll want to consult your instruction manual on how to deal with that. So now that you have all of your computer parts and all of your tools, let's actually get started building. So typically the process that I like to begin with is to put everything that I can into the motherboard. What you're going to need for that is your motherboard, your processor, your RAM, and your CPU cooler. Now I will go step by step and explain all of this stuff, but to start off, let's actually get the motherboard out of the box itself. When you open up your motherboard box, probably one of the first things you're going to see is this big plastic bag with this grid and stuff on it. And the reason for that is because computer components are very delicate. You don't want to go static shocking the crap out of them. So basically this bag helps preventing any static buildup from not shocking your components. So once you get this out, you're gonna to wanna to keep digging around in your motherboard box. And if you pull out this insert, typically, you're gonna see a few more things. You're going to see SATA cables. If you're putting a hard drive into your build, you will absolutely need one of these. But if you're putting an SSD into your build, that depends. If you're using what is called a SATA SSD, then it uses the same SATA connection of a hard drive, which is this physical connection right here. If you're using an M.2 SSD, it will only go directly into this port and screw down. You don't need any cables for that sort of thing. So if you're using an M.2 SSD, you're gonna wanna ignore this, unless you have other drives that use this connector. You're also going to see 
this. This is your IO shield. This is basically a vanity plate that goes in the back of your case and covers up all of your rear IO. That way you're not seeing the inside of your PCB and it basically helps you for sticking your finger through here and touching all the traces and basically it just keeps things looking nice. You're gonna wanna pull that out too. You're also going to definitely want your motherboard manual. You may not need it if you know what you're doing, but it's typically good to have. I like to refer to this to double check what slots your memory goes into. Typically, if you're only doing two slots, it will be two and four, but it never hurts to double check. And then everything else, this is just like a case badge. It's literally a sticker that you can smack on your case. If you want to put this on your case, then keep this out. This basically tells you how to install your processor. That is on the Intel socket, but this is on the AMD sockets. We're going to be using an AMD CPU. So I will explain how to use that. And basically everything else isn't 100% necessary. You basically got your warranty information and your driver disk, except you should probably just download the drivers off the manufacturer's website as those will be more up to date. So the next thing you're gonna wanna get out is your processor. Now I bought this as a bundle off of eBay. Your processor will come in a box with a plastic covering around it. When you pull the processor out, you wanna be very carefully opening that because that can tend to fall out. And these pins on the processor are very, very, very delicate. You do not want to break these or even bend them because you will screw up your entire system. And if you're going to be using the stock cooler, you'll also wanna pull that out. But because I'm using an aftermarket cooler, which is this Noctua one right here, we're not gonna worry about that. Because I'm installing an aftermarket CPU cooler, we're going to need to remove these plastic brackets. If you are using a Wraith Spire or Wraith Stealth, which come with Ryzen 3 and 5 processors, you will also want to remove these. But if you're using a Ryzen 7 or 9 processor, you're going to want to keep these on if you're using the stock cooler. You basically set it on top and then hook underneath the latch and you push the lever down and it clips on. You're good to go. We're not going to worry about that today. So to get started, I'm just going to remove these plastic brackets because I do not need them for my CPU cooler mounting. So typically the processor installation is one of the scariest quote unquote parts about building a computer. And that's just because of how delicate the pins on the processor are. They're very, very fragile. You do not want to break these. There is a gold triangle on one of the corners of our processor that will line up with a triangle on our motherboard socket. Typically with Ryzen processors, the text faces this direction. So this is vertical. It will face this way inside of our system. So the words will be facing towards the back. And you basically just wanna line up the gold triangle on the processor with the black triangle on the socket. So there's a metal lever on one side of the socket, which as we can see is right here. You wanna push this down, pull it away from the socket and lift it straight up. Now our socket is completely open. We are ready to slide in our processor. When you grab the CPU, you wanna hold it by the edges. You don't wanna hold it by the IHS. This is the integrated heat spreader. And you definitely don't wanna be holding it by the metal contacts or pins on Ryzen processors. So the triangles face that way. And you just wanna gently set it down. And now it might not slide into place the first time, but if you give it a little bit of a shift around, it will fall into place. You can give it a tiny bit of a wiggle and that just ensures that it doesn't move around. And now that our processor is installed, we just wanna push down on the lever. You'll feel a little bit of force, don't be afraid of it, and push it back under the latch. And that's it, you've now installed your CPU. Really painless process. It's just really scary to some people. So next up, I wanna go about installing the cooler. If you're using a stock cooler, or even a liquid cooler for that matter, your cooler will probably come with thermal paste pre-applied to the cold plate. And your cold plate is basically just the bottom of your CPU cooler right here. It will come in like a little bit of a grid. That stuff is fine if you wanna use it. If you don't wanna use it, I'm gonna show you how you would clean it off with isopropyl alcohol, because the top of my processor right now is just a tiny bit dirty from like finger oils and stuff like that. So to go about cleaning off our thermal paste, I like using coffee filters. I'm literally just folding it in half a bunch of times so it's got a lot of layers to soak into. And then I unscrew the cap. And then all I do is I hold it up against the top, shake it down a couple times. And now you've got isopropyl alcohol soaked into your coffee filter. 
and then you just go in circles, basically clean off any thermal paste that might be on there. Say if you're installing a new CPU cooler or a new processor, or if you're doing what I'm doing, getting any finger oils and stuff off, you can do that. I'm also gonna do it to the bottom of the cold plate on the air cooler itself, this Noctua cooler. Great, I've now, as you can may or may not be able to see, there was a tiny, tiny bit of thermal paste still left on there. So now that it has been cleaned, we are good to go. Like I mentioned previously, whatever cooler you're installing will probably vary. I'm basically gonna have to let you guys figure this out on your own because each cooler is different especially if you're not installing a stock cooler, like a Wraith or the Intel stock cooler. So basically every process is going to vary. Just follow your instruction manual. You'll survive, I promise you will. Don't worry about it, just take it slow and you'll be all good to go. Now before I go on, I want to explain how to install Thermal paste. Now, like I mentioned previously, if you're using a stock cooler, you really won't have to deal with this. So basically all thermal paste is, or thermal interface material, or Tim, or thermal goop, or the funny gray stuff that tastes funny, it helps transfer the heat from the metal integrated heat spreader on the top of the processor itself that goes into the conductor that is the thermal paste, and into the cold plate of your CPU cooler. There's widely debated methods of doing this. The way I like to do, is I typically add about the size of a pea. You can also do the grain of rice method, typically. Basically what happens is once you actually put your heatsink on top of the processor, the thermal paste spreads out, it gets smushed down, and spreads across the whole thing, so you don't have to go heavy across the whole processor. You just don't want too little thermal paste is all. Having too much won't really hurt you unless it's just an obscene amount and actually like seeping into the socket of the processor itself. Otherwise, you should be pretty fine. Something I do wanna mention, however, is that when you are installing your CPU cooler, you don't wanna put excessive force on any of the screws. What I like to do, especially on most coolers, say you're using like a liquid cooler that uses four screws, one on each corner, you wanna do even mounting pressure. So you'll start from one corner, go to the opposite corner, switch to the opposite side, and come back to the opposite corner. So you're basically doing an X pattern, and that basically just helps ease the compression of the heat sink onto the processor itself. That way you're not like pinching any specific corner or you're causing your board to flex because that's not ideal. You don't want a bent motherboard. So basically all I'm gonna do is I'm going to slowly but surely tighten these screws until it gives me a little bit of a hard time uh, screwing them in any further. And then at that point, I do not want to screw in any further. So right there, that screw just about bottomed out. So I'm gonna keep going, and there we go. I'm not going to torque it any further than that. So now our CPU cooler is installed. So installing RAM is even more simple than installing a processor. Basically, your DIM, this is called a DIM, it's notched on one side. As you can see, it is right there. And on your motherboard, you can probably see the little notches going this way which means the RAM only sits in one direction. If it doesn't fit in the one direction, you basically just wanna flip it around, stick it back in, and you'll be good to go. So, because I'm installing two sticks of memory, I wanna do the second and the fourth slots. Now, this motherboard only has the push down clips like this on one side. This side down here, does not push down. So, two and four, the black slots. Basically, all you wanna do is you line up your RAM, you push it down in, and then you give it a good push on both sides. And you'll hear a double click, one, two. And now, as you can maybe see, this end has actually clasped back. It has now locked the RAM in place. So that's eight gigs of RAM installed, time for 16. Repeat the process, slide the one side in, slide the other side in, push it down all the way, one, two. Perfect, RAM is installed, good job. So the last thing that we need to do to take care of the motherboard is to plug the CPU fan connector in. Now on this motherboard, 
The CPU fan connector is a four pin connector located right here. On your motherboard, it may vary, but usually your CPU fan connectors and pump connectors are located along this top side of the board. You can just plug it in like that but I wanna try and cable manage it a little bit so that I don't have all this excess hanging off. Then I'm gonna see if I can run it under here. And plug neatly back into the fan connector. Now, as you can see, the cable's out of the way. You don't have to worry, this cable's not gonna melt or anything on this bracket. And it's tucked away all nice and neat. Now, before we start installing any of the fun hardware, we want to install our IO shield. Now, if you remember, you pulled this out of your motherboard box and it basically just sits right here. It's just a little cover to prevent you from shoving your hands inside the back of the case. And it just tidies everything up. Plus in the case of this one, everything is labeled. So for example, you've got two USB ports up top you got a PS2 port, you got your DVI, you've got your HDMI, more HDMI, ethernet, and your audio jacks. Typically your audio jacks are on the bottom. So you want to install it properly in that sense. Double check with your motherboard first. Literally all you have to do is line it up against the back of your motherboard and see what uh, ports fit into the holes. Because let's face it, we can all do the square peg in the square hole, round peg in the round hole. But basically just be mindful of that. Make sure you pull any blocking cables out of the way and you will usually slot it in through the back. And then it just lines up in the frame itself and you will hear clicks like that and it will usually click every time you install a corner. So now our IO shield is installed. I can't stick my fingers through it and you give it a light tap note, none of the corners are popping back out. IO shield installed. Now when installing our motherboard, we want to make sure that we're using the proper screws. The ones that come with this case have a hexagonal head to them. This particular case comes with 16 of these screws because they're multi-purpose. So just make sure you're referring to your case manual to ensure that you're using the proper screws. This is also where that magnetic parts tray comes in handy. As you can see, the screws aren't going anywhere because there's a magnet on the back and I can stick it anywhere to the case that I want. Very handy for keeping everything organized. So this particular motherboard is in what's called the micro ATX form factor. And that basically just says how large the motherboard is physically. The most common form factor nowadays is ATX, which is a little bit longer than that because it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven PCIe expansion slots. This is micro ATX. So it has a maximum of one, two, three, Four. So when installing your motherboard, basically all you want to do is find the rear I.O. This is the back of your computer. And you want to line that up with the I.O. shield that you just installed. You just want to lightly, very gently place it on in there. Now there will be what are called standoffs, usually pre-installed. If they're not, you'll want to refer to your motherboard manual about where exactly to install them in. And you basically just want to be careful with it line everything up and eventually all the ports will line up with your IO shield on the back, all your screw holes will line up. And then typically what I like to do is if your case does not have the center mounting hole as a post, which normally holds the motherboard in place, then I like to put in the center screw first. Now in the micro ATX form factor, as well as the ATX form factor, there are usually nine mounting holes. So you basically just wanna go around and screw all of these in because this makes sure that your motherboard is nice and secure in your case. A lot of people say it's okay to not put all of the screws in. And as long as you have at least screws in each of the corners, I typically agree. But just for simplicity's sake, I figure if I have all the screws, I might as well use all of the screws. Now, depending on your case, some of these may be a little bit hard to reach. That's why I like using my iFixit screwdriver because it has a really long neck to it. You can also shrink this down nice and small if you gotta get into a really tight space or anything of that sort. But most of the somewhat higher end cases will make accommodations so that you aren't trying to put screws in at stupid angles or anything like that. And then once you have all of the screws in, I just like going around and ensuring that all of them are nice and tight. And then that way your motherboard doesn't really run any sort of risk of you know, falling out. If you're not moving your system around, then you shouldn't ever have this issue because you'd have to have eight or nine points of failure within each screw. So typically I'd say that you're fine. 
Power supplies come in three main styles. They come in non-modular, they come in semi-modular, and they also come in fully modular. And what modularity is, is in short, it's how many cables are pre-attached to your power supply. So this is a non-modular power supply because I cannot remove any of these cables. They are hardwired into the unit. Now, semi-modular power supplies only have a few of these cables hardwired in. And those cables are typically your 24 pin and your eight pin or four plus four pin ATX EPS power for your CPU. Because chances are, if you're building a computer, you have a motherboard and you have a CPU. And then last but not least is fully modular. And basically none of these cables are pre-installed. The entire back is not blank like this, but it has all of these connectors attached here. And you plug all the cables that you need one by one. So say your motherboard power and what is this? This is your four plus four pin. This is your CPU power. And then maybe one of these, this is your graphics card power, but maybe you don't need Molex. Well, you just don't plug in your Molex connector then. And basically that keeps everything nice and tidy. So you just unscrew the frame from the case and then you install the power supply into the frame. And then you just install the whole frame with the power supply connected back into the case. And now the frame for our power supply is completely uninstalled. Now, what a lot of cases nowadays have is ventilation in the bottom of the case. And it's usually a filtered intake as well because the power supply itself sucks air in through the fan and then spits it out the back here. See, as you can see, that's where you turn the power supply on. So since there's a filtered intake on this case, I'm going to put it fan side down. There isn't really any sort of right or wrong way to do this. The only wrong way I could see is if you're setting your computer on say really thick carpet with the fan side down. In that case, you're gonna wanna do fan side up. That way you're not suffocating your power supply and quite literally burning it out and starving it of oxygen. So all I do is I'm gonna line this frame back up with the back of our power supply. I'm just gonna get the one screw started a little bit. This one started a little bit. And there you have it, one bracket installed on the power supply. All I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna slide the power supply back into the case itself, like so. Then it just sits right back in the bottom of the case. From there, I wanna line up the bracket with the back of the case and then grab these screws I have left up here. And just like that, power supply is installed. So the next thing I wanna install is our SSD. This is our storage drive. This interface on the back right here is called SATA or SATA. And you've got two connectors on here. You've got the small one, which is your data connector. This is what plugs into your motherboard. And then you've got your power connector. This is what plugs into your power supply. So to install this solid state drive into this case, what we need is four of these little rubber spacer looking thingies. These basically will slide into the actual frame of the case itself, as well as four of these type of screws. They're a little bit longer and they're only threaded towards the end. And that's because it actually gives us room to stick them through the rubber spacers itself. So that's a real simple installation. You just put the screw into the rubber spacer, screw it into the back of the SSD, and then you're good. Just repeat that three more times, and soon enough, you're all good to start installing this in your case. Now, in this case, you have two locations to mount your solid state drive. You can either mount it down here or more up here. I have my fan hub kind of up in this upper spot, so I'm going to be putting this in the lower position. So all you need to do is you line up the rubber grommets you just installed with holes, slide it straight sideways. Friction will basically hold it in place. Our SSD is now installed. Okay, so before I go about installing the last component, which is the graphics card, I wanna start getting all of the cables situated because as you can see, I went with a non-modular power supply and therefore there's just a lot of cables kind of going nuts and it's definitely not gonna look any better when I try cable managing back here. So I'm gonna start doing some of my cable runs first and then we'll see how that goes and then put the graphics card in.
Okay, so my camera died last night while I was in the middle of cable management, but that's okay. I wasn't really doing anything important, and I can still explain everything that I did. There are cable tie-down points. As you can see, I have all of these zip ties still in here. I've left them all loose because I like routing more cables as I go, and then once I'm complete, I can then cinch them all down and keep them nice and tidy. Your motherboard 24 pin is over here. It's literally just a two by 12 pin connector. Way up in this top corner is your eight pin, your CPU power. I also routed out the PCIe six plus two pin connectors. This graphics card has one six pin and one eight pin. I also installed the front panel headers down here as well as the USB 3 connector right here. Basically all your front panel headers are everything that controls your front panel. So in this case, we've got two USB 3.0 ports, your power button, your headphone and your microphone jack, as well as your reset switch. But the front panel connectors are all super teeny tiny. They are honestly probably some of the most frustrating cables to plug in just because of how small they are. I also went ahead and installed the SATA data cable, which goes from the SSD to the motherboard. This is basically just the cable that connects to your system and it shows the volume of the drive, whereas the much wider connector is the SATA power connector. But now that we're all caught back up, let's actually get to installing the graphics card. So to install your graphics card, the very first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you remove the proper PCI Express expansion covers. And you can figure out which ones that you need to remove based on your motherboard's layout. So for example, this really, really long slot up here, it's white with like a metal frame around it. That is called a PCIe 16X slot or X16 slot. And that's basically the amount of bandwidth that is able to go through that port itself and into whatever device that is plugged into it. So typically for graphics cards, you will be using that slot because they have a PCIe 16X connector. So basically you just wanna keep an eye on what position your slot is in and then you're gonna to wanna to remove the cover that is associated with that slot. Typically, most graphics cards are two slots. One, two, as you can see right here. There are some that are one slot. There are a lot more now due to the RTX 30 series coming out. There are a lot more that are three slot. And as a matter of fact, there are even some that are four slot, which is absolutely ridiculous. And you will probably never have to deal with them unless you're looking for that very specific card. So because there's two slots, we wanna remove the slot associated with the PCI Express port on our motherboard, as well as the one below it. Now what some cases have is this little PCI Express locking cover. It's basically just a metal plate that keeps all your screws secured. It kind of prevents anyone from pulling your graphics card without you wanting to. But if that's the case, you have much bigger problems on your hands. So in most cases, there will be the actual screws that you unscrew and you can remove the physical bracket itself. But in this case, you just have to stick a screwdriver inside each of these little covers right here and just wiggle it a bunch until it snaps out. Now for this case, we're gonna use the same hexagonal headed screws that we used to screw in our motherboard. So basically you just wanna maneuver your graphics card on in there nice and neat. You wanna make sure it sits within those rear PCIe expansion slots that we removed and then just line it up with the slot, give it a firm push and 
graphics card installed. I want to reinstall this metal PCIe locking bracket. And basically it just kind of slots back on into the back of the case right here. I want to lift the graphics card up as much as I can because this helps prevent what's called GPU sag. And that's basically just when the graphics card itself is so heavy that it actually physically leans down and like bends the slot of the motherboard that it's actually installed into. And that's not okay. You don't want to let your system do that for a while because that can actually damage your motherboard itself. From there, we're just going to take our 6 plus 2 pin PCI Express power connectors and install them into the rectangular ports, usually located on the end of your graphics card. And now these only go in one way. And in this particular card, this little clip right here faces downward. So I'm just going to try and get those as tight together as I can. And there you go. Graphics card is now being powered. So to make sure that the system actually posts for the first time, you're going to need a few things, which are pretty common sense. You're going to need a monitor, which will plug into the computer, and from there you're going to just need the power cable for the monitor itself, as well as your display cable of choice. I'm going with HDMI. You're also going to need the power cable that came with your power supply. It plugs from the power supply into your wall, and then just any basic keyboard and mouse. If you're using your gaming peripherals, that'll work too. I'm just using these real cheap ones from Dell. These are just my system diagnostics peripherals that I keep on hand in case I need a spare. And then from there, it's all pretty plug and play. After plugging your power supply into the wall to ensure that it's going to be properly grounded, you're going to want to switch this switch on the back into the on position, to the line, not the circle. So now that we've got all of our connectors plugged in, let's actually power it on for the first time. And that's the screen that we want to see. From there, you're going to go ahead and enter the BIOS and install Windows from your boot media, change the boot priority, and then boot into Windows. Activate your license if you have it, and then you'll be good to go. I'll be making a video on how to do that in the future, so if you're interested, make sure to click the I in the top right corner to see how to do that yourself. So now that we know that we're able to get into the BIOS, I'm going to go ahead and tidy up the back of the case, put all the side panels back on and the fan filters, and then we'll be all good to go. That just about does it. We've got one heck of a system right here. So if you were following along with me and your system's now just kind of idling, congratulations! You've just built yourself a brand new gaming PC with your own two hands. I told you it was simple. But anyways, that's gonna do it for now. So if you liked this video, you know what to do. And if you want to see more stuff like this, make sure to get subbed below because I love making this stuff for you guys. And as always, have a good one. Honey, I'm a big